Hi ev- everyone, welcome back to the Governors for Schools podcast and to the third week of our Counting the Cost campaign, in which we dig down into the key issues affecting the education landscape as the cost of living crisis continues to impact school communities. This week, we're taking a look at how governors can support schools in providing enriching learning experiences for less advantaged pupils when budgets are tight. For governors, this could mean taking a hard look at the ways in which budgets are spent and how school leaders are working to provide learners with, from low-income families the support they need to thrive. As listeners are probably well aware, the COVID-19 crisis widened attainment gaps between less advantaged pupils and their better-off peers, an issue that threatens to get worse as the cost of living crisis bites. So how can governors ensure schools make strategic decisions that boost social mobility and make the most of a tight budget? To help us answer this question today, a guest from three organisations committed to bridging attainment gaps and ensuring all pupils receive the inspiring education they deserve. I'm really pleased to be joined by Susanna Hardiman, CEO of Action Tutoring, Anne-Marie Canning, CEO of The Brilliant Club, and Martin Galway, Head of School Programmes at the National Literacy Trust. Welcome, everyone. So to kick us off, it would be great to learn a little bit more about your organisations and how you see the, the cost of living crisis affecting pupil learning and development at the moment. So let's start with Anne-Marie, if that's OK. I'm, I'm Anne-Marie. I'm the CEO of The Brilliant Club. I've been with the charity since the first day of lockdown, so around three years. We are a nationwide education charity helping the least advantaged pupils access the most highly competitive universities and then also helping them to flourish once they study there as undergraduates. Um, We work with around 22,000 pupils a year, uh, over a thousand schools uh, and we are certainly seeing the cost of living biting for the young people that we work with uh, on a daily basis. So we've been doing a lot of work recently thinking about how we can sort of design our programmes so that from the off, they're inclusive in terms of socioeconomic background. Our target pupils are often those on pupil premium, first in family to university, living in areas that are not socioeconomically advantaged. So for us, it's really important that we hardwire in from the very beginning a programme that is inclusive of those children and families. Um, So that's meant working with our schools and university partners to really put together sensitive and thoughtful responses to the cost of living. Uh, crisis. And, you know, it's just very pragmatic stuff. For example, we've committed that no child will visit a university campus and not be fed. It's a really basic, simple principle, but it's one that we all need as partners to commit to in order to make sure no child is going home hungry from what is supposed to be a very exciting day visiting a university. We've also been doing things thinking about our tutors Uh, and looking after them in terms of the cost of living. Uh, Our PhD tutors who, you know, themselves are facing into uh, cost of living issues. So it's really thinking about cost of living, one for the children, young people and families we serve, the schools and university partners, and then thinking also about our tutor base as well. It's fabulous. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Susanna? So I'm Susanna. I'm the founder and CEO of Action Tutoring. I've been with the organisation for really quite a long time now, just over a decade. And we work uh, nationwide with schools across England with eight main hubs covering most of the country and support about six and a half thousand pupils a year. And our core aim is to support pupils at the end of primary or the end of secondary who are at risk of leaving those crucial junctures without basic standards in English and maths, because we believe that having those basic standards is really fundamental to unlocking those doors to further education, employment or training. We started off working with GCSE pupils and it didn't take long to realise that if we could tackle some of those misconceptions earlier on, we could set pupils on a great trajectory to achieve at secondary. So we launched in primary schools about six years ago and now support pupils on that year five, year six cusp as they're heading into secondary school, making sure they're as, as ready as possible to hit the ground running in those core subjects in English and maths to set them on a really strong trajectory to future attainment. All of our work is delivered in partnerships with schools and we've certainly been more aware than ever of the the budget challenges that schools are facing at present and we've seen that sort of creeping in over the last couple of years and sadly uh, no signs that it's about to abate swiftly. Our model has always been part fundraised and part school contribution to cover our costs 
And we've been thinking really hard about what's the balance between quality and impact of delivery whilst trying to keep our costs as reasonable to schools as possible. At present, we're also benefiting benefiting from funding from the National Tutoring Programme and, and know that that's funding schools are accessing. So we've been working closely with schools to think about how they can maximise that, how they can use it to impact as many pupils facing disadvantage as possible. And we're already thinking hard about how we can support schools as that NTP subsidy decreases next year and then comes to an end in 2024 so that we're not having to increase our costs to them and that valuable support can continue to be offered we're acutely aware that that attainment gap has only uh, continued to sadly get bigger as a result of the pandemic. Um, so it strikes us that although that NTP subsidy is decreasing, uh, there's certainly no shortage of need out there for schools and for pupils and try trying to make that work as, in as financially a clever way as possible for schools um, is something we're thinking really hard about. Great. Thanks, Susanna. And last but not least, Martin. Hi, I'm Martin Galway. I'm Head of School Programmes at the National Literacy Trust, an independent uh, national charity. We work across the four nations, um, both in a mixture of schools facing work and working through our current number 17 community hubs um, that reaches all across England into Scotland and Wales and moving towards working within 100 of the areas most in need. Um, our work extends across schools programmes. That's essentially my world. I, I work with schools programmes along the lines of reading for pleasure, development of libraries, book gifting, developing volitional readers and primary CPD. So the development of cost effective evidence informed CPD training conference events for schools. Beyond that, we undertake large scale research. We undertake annually the largest research relating to literacy and annual survey um, that draws upon the views of teachers, school leaders and children. And from that, we're able to map trends over time. We're currently very interested in uh, the impact of the cost of living crisis, published a report just in December 2022 and moving into looking at financial capability because of the long term effects this is likely to have. Uh, we also work to steer policy wherever possible and to galvanise collective action across the third sector within the, the profession itself and drawing upon our corporate partners. So for example, we one of the programs in my stable is the primary school library alliance work whereby we're aiming to transform 1000 school libraries by 2025 We've got an extensive range of partners helping us in that endeavor and the need has only gotten greater um, that report that we published in De december 2022 shows that at a time when people are finding the squeeze of funding is affecting absolute life essentials Items that could be considered non-essential, such as books, which we would argue are essential, especially if we're serious about making a long-term difference um, to literacy and, by extension, to intergenerational cycles of poverty, we need to be holding that line and making sure that we're pushing forward to ensure access to literature and the life chances that come from literacy for all children and young people. That's great. Thank you, Martin. So just to kick us off, really, into kind of having more of a conversation about this you know the cost of living crisis obviously has the potential to really compound issues surrounding social mobility which all of your organizations are involved with um and i'm just kind of wondering your take on you know what role do, do charitable and community organizations play at this point in helping schools tackle social mobility issues as as the you know particularly given the fact that school budgets are really tight at the moment anyone feel free to kick us off I think one of the things I've been really impressed with visiting schools that we work with and talking to them is how many are really tapped into so many different charities and organizations in their community that they can point their families too and I think schools can be that kind of hub of resource and information um, that obviously requires knowing your families knowing knowing what their needs might be and then having people that are able to do that signposting but but schools being that sort of central place where families can get advice and support 
for different needs, I think can be a really powerful way that that schools can sort of work with other providers in the community so that not all all the needs are on them. Um, But there is that sort of joined up approach. Food banks are a very obvious one. And I know many schools do referrals to food banks and and have that that close connection. But um, I've noticed an increasing number of other services sort of being promoted in schools or leaflets left in receptions and things to um, available families, as I say. So the onus isn't all on the school to have to provide that support, but is connecting people with others in the community working on specific issues. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of, you know, the ways in which governors and schools can kind of work together to to find these resources, is there any particular sort of advice you'd have in that respect in terms of um, bringing in, you know, third parties? I mean, from from my perspective, I think, um, you know, school school governing bodies and and uh, multi academy trust governing bodies often have a, a link governor for pupil premium. I, I think it would be entirely appropriate at this moment in time to have a link governor for cost of living issues facing the school community, um, because it will be affecting teachers, families, and and children as well. And, you know, a a link governor like that can do all sorts of brilliant things, asking the right questions about where pupil premium funding is going, um, you know, making sure that that is reaching uh, the students it's allocated uh, to benefit. But then also making sure that the schools really lined up in terms of parental engagement, because really good parental engagement means that you can find out about all types of community assets. So you've got three nationwide um, education charities on the podcast here, but each school will be surrounded by organisations like a food bank or baby banks or benefits advice. There's a whole range of um, sort of community assets that can be drawn upon. And it's really through having good conversations with parents that you start to learn about those. those. Very often, it's parents running them for the benefit of other parents in very low income areas. Um, So I think governors asking the right questions. um, Also, you know, speaking regularly to teachers about what they're seeing, um, asking the questions about, you know, what what you're seeing in your classrooms right now. I work in Bradford um, as part of something called uh, the Alliance for Life Chances. Uh, I've heard very, very regularly teachers expressing concern about lack of warm clothing. Um, and so asking frontline teachers, what are you seeing? What 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 are the sorts of issues that are presented in your classroom so that you can respond uh, in governing body terms? Because, you know, for me, cost of living it is a strategic issue for schools it sounds very domestic talking about you know clothing and and uniform swaps and and things like you know referrals to a local food bank you know acting as a warm bank making sure you're staying open for homework clubs where kids can stay warm that all sounds very pragmatic and domestic but it's actually an important strategic issue where if you tie it all together you can create an environment where kids despite facing very very difficult circumstances still have a chance to flourish I mean, the fact the final thing I'd say is if I was a governor right now, I have been a governor in the past, but not at the moment, I'd be looking into poverty proof in my school. So this is a, an approach that emerged in the northeast. Um, it's really easy if you give it Google, you know, really thinking about how you hardwire in advantage rather than disadvantage to your school community and school architecture. Great. Thank, thank you, Anne-Marie. That's really, really helpful. So in terms of, you know, the kind of the skills and and the educational experiences that we should kind of prioritise to help boost young people's prospects, do you have any kind of a a take on that? Um, Because we've been talking very generally about kind of bridging attainment gaps, etc. Is there any particular skills that you think, you know, we could hone in on um, at this point? Sure. I've certainly got some views. I'm I'm going to go early. I think it's a perennial perennial argument that you know time and time again the the wide range of evidence out there around literacy and lord knows there's plenty of evidence in the world of literacy points towards talk and early talk in particular if we're serious about being evidence informed in terms of making a difference to these cycles of poverty or disadvantage or just you know wide attainment um that that Early talk investment there is going to be critical. But at the moment, because of the effects of the pandemic, not just the earliest talk. So normally I'd be talking about 0 to 3 and then 3 to 5 as being especially critical in terms of how children develop and, and the impact that has on not just their attainment at 11, at secondary and beyond, but also in terms of the, the social aspects within school. Um, following the pandemic, time and time again, we're seeing um, reports in year two, three. So 
seven year olds, eight year olds, nine year olds, where you can see the the legacy effects of the time out of the classroom, uh, the impact on the sorts of work that could be handled in that way that you can only really structure when you're in the classroom. You know, we've made incredible leaps and gains in terms of how online resources have been able to help us through, through you know, targeting lessons, through tuition, through delivering CPD. But there's something about the organic talk, the serve and return of a one-to-one discussion in the classroom that, you, you know, you can't be. So that's something that we're looking to prioritise as part of a massive campaign going forward over the next few years. We, we've always been in that space, but we're redoubling our efforts along the lines of how we support parents in particular, um, harking back to um, the comments made just now around how important parents are in this. We have what we call literacy champions who are kind of a bridge between schools, other local community service providers, so in health, in social care, food banks. If you're not having that, you do need to look out to your parent community. And so reaching out and extending the these messages around the importance of early communication and, and that, how simple it often is. That's, the, that's one of the things that can sometimes be most surprising is once you get the chance to talk directly to people that are perhaps a little harder to reach, maybe a little fearful of coming to the school grounds, how reassuring it is for them to actually hear we're not talking about rocket science here or anything that's going to be too expensive. It's actually, you know, as simple as these few steps that we want to share with you here and now. Great. Thanks, Martin. Anne-Marie, do you have something to say? Yeah, absolutely. Just just around engaging parents in, in, in that early talk. In Bradford, we've got an initiative called 50 Things Before Five, which is all about the sort of ordinary things you can do with your little one to get them talking. And I remember very powerfully, you know, some parents uh, in, in a, a local area saying, well, I don't have access to a museum or a library around here. And, you know, 50 Things Before Five says, right, let's get into the supermarket and use the supermarket as a place to start talking and using words and encountering new new things. And so really encouraging parents to work with what they've got right now. It's not about having a massive collection of books, as lovely as that is. It's really about getting that talk going that that Martin described so um, yeah just to just to en- enhance that message around encouraging parents to work with what they've got and also just seeing parents as assets to their children's lives I think very often I encounter folks who who see particularly low-income parents as a sort of a barrier to their children um, our experience at the Brilliant Club through running a, an initiative called Parent Power which is working in around 15 uh, places in the UK places like Knowlesley and uh, you know, Fenland, places like that, is that parents are desperate to help their kids. They're desperate to give them a great start in life. What they're very often lacking is a sort of route into doing that. And so that's why I talked about parental engagement area uh, earlier, because if we get that right between school and, and parent, you've basically created a very powerful alliance for boosting children's life chances uh, straight off the bat. It's great. Th- thank you. Um, Suzanne, do you have anything to add at all to this? Completely agree about the points about parents. And it, it, it's something that I think there's just so much more that can be done to strengthen those ties. And sometimes actually as a, a charity coming into a school, we haven't always found it easy to have that access to parents because inevitably those relationships sit with the school. But certainly where we have got parental buy-in to our programmes alongside the school encouragement, it's, as Anne-Marie said, a really powerful combination. I think one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot recently is just how tricky the balance is for schools and for governors when making budget decisions at the moment of which needs do you prioritise the most. And I'm acutely aware that we can offer the best tutoring programme uh, we possibly can. But if pupils are coming hungry, they're not in a good emotional state, they're not they're struggling with behaviour, getting back into the classroom post pandemic, then it doesn't matter how good the English and maths tutoring might be, that they're, they're not ready for that learning. And that's sort of balance of holistic needs how do we make sure they're clothed they're fed they're emotionally and mentally in a good place that they're ready to learn are all critical factors to the to the success of a program like ours and I think that is an increasing challenge for for school leaders and for governors to think through what is it that I'm prioritizing here is it mental well-being is it those basic physical needs of clothes is it, is it the academic at, academic attainment? Obviously, in an ideal world, it would be all of those things. Um, but when budgets are increasingly tight and needs are only ever increasing, I think some of those decisions are really challenging to make. Yeah, I think your point about 
well-being is really important. And I wanted to ask, actually, in terms of, you know, integrating sort of well-being sort of initiatives into the learning experience. Um, I wonder if you have anything to say about that. Is there anything in your organizations that like uh, takes well-being into account in, in, in its programs at all, as p- particularly because obviously well-being is, is um, becoming more of a pressing issue as the cost of living crisis continues? Yeah, Martin. Yeah, I mean, we, well, I'll give you an example, and there's a bit of a lesson from it. So we have something that is branded as Take Care, and you're, it's, it's been quite present and visible on our social media channels. And it's it's born out of research that basically suggests, you know, just reading for 10 minutes a day can have a benefit to your well-being. But what that can easily become is this really crude message of, okay, read for 10 minutes, bang, I feel better. I think it's about maintaining a real sense of what do we mean by well-being. Um, there's been almost uh, – I should – tread carefully when I say this, but I almost got well-being fatigued myself when I was feeling most stressed during the lockdown. There were so many things coming my way. I was having to adapt to online delivery of, of, of all kinds of services, you know, a whole new field. And and you can almost be bombarded with so much that you kind of feel this isn't speaking to me. This isn't necessarily addressing my needs. So within any talk about well-being, I think we really need to think about the staff well-being, you know, and how much capacity they have to be able to look at, you know, what am I prioritising? How clearly am I seeing my own class and children in front of me? Um, what I would also um, urge is that we, we we do think about those things that go beyond, you know, just things that tend to be associated with well-being those sorts of holistic measures along the lines of you know exercise taking time to relax and just having (laughs) going to sound talk obsessed but having time to really talk and get to know the children that you're working with because you know so much of the work we do to improve can be driven by data how well do we know those children in our classroom and that goes back to that capacity at a time when you're trying to gain what might feel like lost ground carving out space to have you know meaningful conversations in class is going to be really important and so I think that in itself is is a message I would want to get through you know how are we as a school how are we as governors supporting the school to carve out space to really know the children beyond any data coming from measures or tests or assessments. Great thank you uh, Anne Marie or Susanna anything to add to that at all? Just to say some of the most exciting work I've seen post pandemic has been the Young in Covid project in Bradford which was all about allowing young people to listen to other young people across the city to come together and they've they've made a film uh, if you if you type young in young into covid into a search engine you'll be able to see it so that ability to narrate their own experience of of what happened in covid to talk about that has been i think a really exciting part of how we've started to respond to some of the needs in the city of Bradford as we've emerged from COVID. So we know that well-being is is one of those sort of primary needs that then engenders an ability to engage in curriculum, uh, you know, uh, be be successful in the school setting. Um, as we say, you know, everything's connected. So um, it's really important as a governor that you sort of it's a difficult job, but looking at all these different facets of a young person's educational experience in your school, working out what's a priority at that moment in time and starting to really think about how you phase things together, what needs to happen for one class versus another. It, it, it really is that sort of discussion that will enable governing bodies and teachers to make really excellent decisions about what a young person or a cohort of young people need, first and foremost. And um, what I will say is, you know, We know that things like tutoring will make a a massive difference in uh, helping to close some of these attainment gaps, which are increasingly widening. I think it's really important we don't lose sight of all the fun extracurricular activities as well. We've had young people who've not had a chance to do much fun stuff for quite a number of years. So I um, I always encourage folks to think, yep, yeah, let's do the catch up um, tutoring provision. But also it's really important kids get a chance to explore outside of the curriculum. That's you know what we're all about, the brilliant club. But also get a chance to enjoy things like sports, music, theatre, all the things that perhaps were not available to them during the lockdown years. That's great. Thank you. Susanna, did you have something to say there? Yeah, I couldn't agree more about the the fun. Um, I'm a governor of a primary school in in South East London, and and that's a conversation we've certainly been having as a governing body of let's make sure that those residential trips that need subsidising, it's a school with a high percentage of pupil premium, let's make sure that those those trips are are still going ahead, that those are prioritised. As you say, Anne-Marie, all the sort of extracurricular activities 
and and so on. And again, I've been really impressed with the way some schools are, are being really quite innovative to run some of these things in a slightly more cost effective way than than perhaps they have before. But just going back to to the point about well being and the importance of teacher well being as well as pupil well being. Again, another initiative that the school where I'm a governor at has has been implementing that I've been really impressed with is actually using some additional fundraising they received to employ a well-being coach for staff with the rationale that if teachers are in as healthy a place as possible then they're going to be all the better able to deal with the needs in their classroom and to support their pupils and I thought that was just really interesting use of that additional funding they received to, to focus that on their staff well-being as well as all the giving out that's going on to families and pupils. Yeah, definitely. All of these things are really interconnected. Um, it's something that part of this campaign we really want to highlight. Martin and do you have something? Anne Marie was next. Yeah, oh, Anne Marie. Sorry, <laughs> losing sight of the of the hands. Anne Marie. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to sort of build on that point a little bit. One one of the things again we did in Bradford, where where I uh, have this role working on a broad alliance for social mobility, is we established a school wellbeing service for for teachers. You know to recognise the toll that you know COVID lockdown teaching was taking on teachers. It strikes me that you know we've continued that service and it's needed just as much now because the emotional toll and burden of supporting children who are in some in dire circumstances the constant it's corrosive to see children in a scenario where they don't have enough eat to eat or they're not warm enough it really does take its toll on teachers so I think there's a growing recognition that you know teachers are really bearing the brunt of some of this in terms of seeing it presenting in their classroom with you know children and young people they care about facing very difficult circumstances But also, I think staff more broadly, you know, our teachers aren't immune to cost of living issues and neither are our support staff. And I think it's really important as a governor that, yep, we we care about children. We care about the families that we serve, but also the the staff across the, the, the school. How are they coping in the current environment, be it your teachers or your support staff across across the school? Yeah, it's a really important point. And it is something that we will be kind of addressing toward, towards the end of the campaign because it's something we don't want to miss out on. Martin? Yeah, I mean, first, I just want to echo that. I think it should be a standing item at any governor's uh, meeting for, for as long as it's needed, really, or if not permanently, because we need to understand, you know, what those sorts of um, tensions can lead to within a school and how we can go about um, supporting colleagues to make sure that, the, that, that those sorts of impacts on the staff themselves and the leaders, because, you know, at the end of the day, there is so much that travels all the way up to the the head, the SLT, and then who who's who's their ear. And I think this week we're acutely aware of how important that is that we're making sure that our school leaders are especially well supported. I just wanted to make a case for agency and community as well. So you know, setting aside the NLT, which is all about community, I'm a governor in Harlow, absolutely privileged to work in an amazing um, school, and. They've worked so hard to develop the community that does bring the parents in. In fact, you know, very many times we'll have agency workers choosing to have visits on the site because of the nature of how things feel there and how less threatening it is. But just things that are quite quite simple to implement now that we're out of the restrictions of lockdown, things like stay and play, that happens so often with younger children, but taking that across the whole school, um, I'm assuming everyone knows that it's, you know, stay and play, parents come drop off and then they spend some time in the classroom, get to enjoy some of what the children are doing and there's a degree of agency in terms of children choosing what they're going to share with their parents. That that can be such a powerful driver that's you know low cost um, takes it across the whole school, so there's a shared sense of endeavour. A whole school book study I can't tell you. I mean, I've written multiple blogs about that. We've presented at international conferences. Just a simple act of op- having a part of the year where everyone's working on the same thing. And I think it works on a um, sort of pr- same principle as a, a lovely project we're developing at the moment where we're looking at intergenerational story work between residents of care homes and children in schools. But as a teacher, you know, there would be some children that you would see an entirely different human being when they, near the top of the school, you know, maybe year five, year six, go and read with a f- four, five, six year old. And providing those opportunities for kind of, I guess, a school-based version of Matrix working where, you know, the usual boundaries of, okay, this is our year group mission. No, here we're looking at how we develop in community can be really powerful. 
uh, learning councils that are actually truly learning councils. They don't just, you know, talk about what's going to be the allowed snacks on the school playground. They actually go and deliver lessons, say, or go and do interviews with smaller children. They're, they're just wonderful ways by which you can give the whole collective of a school a shared sense of mission and just um, that, something that sits outside of something that might seem high level strategic. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. So in terms of, um, say you were a governor governor on a governing board looking to kind of ask questions um, about this about this topic, about bridging attainment gaps, about in- increasing, you know, um, pupil engagement with some of the initiatives you mentioned. What are the kind of the, the, the key questions you, you would ask during this meeting? What would be your top priorities? Would it be too simple to say, what are we doing and why are we doing it? And how do we know that it's doing what we want it to do? I mean, that's they're perennial governor questions. But when mm-hmm. money's tight, you need to ask them all the more rigorously, really, in a supportive way, of course, keeping in mind much of what we've discussed already. But, you know, I think we've seen a proliferation of services, packages, products that, you know, are tapping into the whole drive to be evidence informed the needs to address gaps that have emerged over the last few years. And so it's, you know, it's quite a, a well-funded, aggressive market. So being really clear on the shared evidence base and what, what it means to be critical around, you know, true criticality around where we're spending our money and why is always going to be a central part of what I'd be asking. Absolutely, starting with the, the fundamentals. Um, Anne-Marie? Yeah, so I guess I'd start from first principles, which is this is not a time to become less ambitious for children from pupil premium backgrounds. It can feel like cost of living is is dragging your eyes down to making sure kids are, are fed and, and watered and warm. Uh, and, th- and that's fair enough. But we've got to make sure we toggle up and down and we make sure we've got a strategy uh, for our pupil premium children um, and, and other children who have um, specific needs within the school. So having a very clear strategic intent for those kids and being ambitious about their futures. That's the first thing I'd say. Then I'd ask, you know, where, where's the money going? And how do we know that that's a good use of money? So what's the evidence that this is, you know, an intervention that makes a difference that we want to um, secure for, for the young people that we work with? M- my fourth question would be, how are we making life a bit easier for families who are struggling? And can we do more to make things a little bit easier? And my final question would be is, how do we know we're not contributing to the problem? So how do we know we're not paying poverty wages to our cleaners or our uh, support staff? And so for me, those five questions, sort of strategic, where's the cash going? How do we know it's making a difference? How can we make things easier for, for, for our communities? And finally, how do we know we're not contributing to the problem? That's the sequence I'd, I'd probably work through. And then if I'm allowed one more question, I'd, I'd ask the teachers who are in front of me how they're doing as well. Mm hmm. Yeah, great. That's a great set of questions. Um, Susanna? I think really any organisation coming into a school or wanting to work in a school needs to be able to demonstrate their their value and their impact. And and if you're looking at what's already going on in a school, those questions of of value and impact are surely front and centre. But I think it's also about governors just keeping an eye that that support is being spread holistically across the school that it's not all sort of targeted at one particular need or one particular year group and that can be challenging when difficult decisions need need to be made but making sure as far as possible needs are being met holistically around mental health well-being physical needs academic attainment and so on but for all of those I think impact and value need to be front and centre and value doesn't have to mean cheap it doesn't mean the cheapest program out there (laughs) which just want to clarify that you know it might well be worth paying for a program that's a bit more expensive but gets better results at at the end of the day so it's definitely not about just sourcing the cheapest things out there in the community but looking at what difference will they really make what's the evidence base for them and um, there's there's so many fantastic resources to help schools make some of those decisions now. Mm, for sure. Uh, Martin, do you have something to add there? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a very simple question, but also just how can I be most helpful? I mean, as a governor, especially mm. if you're a governor that's got some level of expertise or experience within the field, you can be tempted to try and do all sorts of things to try and help save the world in, in your local area. But but really knowing what would be most helpful to the school, you know, keeping in mind the requirements that you, of the role of governance itself. That's a very important question to be asking because you can almost be doing too much to try and help at this moment in time. 
Mm. Yeah, exactly. I think the final thing governors can be asking is whether there's any external funding in the community that the school can tap into. And I know some schools are incredibly proactive at, at sourcing that, applying for additional grants, and obviously that requires time and capacity to do that. But I've seen some great examples of schools doing quite a bit of their own additional fundraising from businesses or local grant making bodies in the community to help cover the cost of residential trips or pay for extra interventions or extracurricular activities and and so on and again that's probably a question just worth worth asking are there any pots out there that we could be looking into yeah thanks everyone that's really helpful insightful comments there and things that uh, listeners can can bring forward in into their meetings so I appreciate that I've taken up quite a bit of your time today so I guess just to wrap up should we just go around and see if you have any final thoughts um and just let us know how governors and um, education professionals can find out more about your organizations should we start with Martin you can find out more about our organisation by heading to the National Literacy Trust website. Uh, given that we've been talking so much around uh, community and in particular parental engagement, um, schools may want to flag a Words for Life sister site that has a whole host of activities, supporting resources, uh, banded into age groups so that parents can quite easily find relevant material to support them as they support their children's literacy development. That's great, thank you. Um, Anne-Marie? I think probably my final thought is how important it is that we have brilliant school governors to help schools and colleges weather what they're seeing at the moment and that the skills you're bringing are are really providing very valuable support in a very difficult few years and months for for the sector so um you know to keep doing what you're doing and and thank you so much for doing it and if you want to connect with the brilliant club we've got a very distinctive name so if you just give us a google uh, you can get in contact about any of our programs some of them are pupil premium funded and some of them actually are free free for schools and young people to participate in so uh, yeah give us a google and 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 come and see if we can help you guys out it's mm-hmm. great thank you and yeah i want to reflect what you what you just said at the beginning about the importance of governors there might be some non non-governors listening to this so you know if if you're interested do apply through governors for schools you're sort of helped every step of the way through the application process and it's a really rewarding experience so yeah susanna I'm going to steal something Anne-Marie said earlier, which was now is not the time to lower our aspirations um, for pupils. It's a it's a really challenging circumstances we're in at the moment. But as I'm sure listeners know, the attainment gap has never been wider in a decade and that need to stay focused on how we can do what we can um, for disadvantaged pupils and keep those aspirations high uh, feels really important despite the challenges. Um, if you want to find out more about Action Tutoring, again, give us a Google, actiontutoring.org.uk. We work in schools across the country. Our work is heavily subsidised by fundraising to try and keep costs as reasonable for schools as possible. And uh, 70% of the pupils we support are eligible for the pupil premium. So we particularly love to connect with schools in areas of high disadvantage. Great. And we will include links to all of your organisations in the show notes um, and on our campaign resources page. So if anyone's interested, please head there at www.governorsforschools.org.uk. Um, you'll also find links to our campaign articles, video content and some some helpful resources to support you in your role as a governor. So just to wrap up, many thanks to all of the guests today. Um, thank you to Alan and Overy for generously sponsoring the Counting the Cost campaign and making possible the production of our campaign materials. Next week, we'll turn our attention to how the cost of living crisis is affecting staff recruitment, retention and well-being in schools and how governors can help. Mm-hmm.